Our next session is a continuation on the general theme of innovation and clinical trials. Uh, we're still uh, focusing very much on facilitating the environment for innovation. Um, our next session introduces the concept of how patient centricity can drive innovation. And we have a, a really tremendous panel here to talk to us about two initiatives that set the stage, in fact, for how uh, this can happen. Patient centricity within Pfizer Oncology is a long-standing tradition with robust and mature patient advocacy efforts and relationships. In 2019, to expand these efforts and further embed patient insights and experiences into all activities, Pfizer Oncology US launched an initiative to create a patient-centric ecosystem. You're going to hear the acronym POPSI throughout this uh, panel, standing for patient-centric ecosystem. Please welcome two team members from the Pfizer US team who will share details related to this initiative. First, let me introduce Sarah Pearson, who is the director, patient recruitment programs, and leads a team of strategists and specialists that support Pfizer's oncology clinical trials. Sarah's primary responsibility is to ensure that all of Pfizer's oncology clinical trials have a clear, well-planned, and thoughtful recruitment strategy that focuses on building clinical trial options to the right patients at the right time. In addition, Sarah has been one of the co-leads developing the PfizerClinicalTrials.com website, a platform aimed at educating people about clinical trials and increasing awareness of Pfizer clinical trials in general. Please also welcome Marianne Gandhi, who is the lead leader of Pfizer Oncology's newly formed Patient Solutions and Alliances Group for North America. Under her leadership, this group is actively aligning with national stakeholders to understand and collaboratively address access, disparities, and bringing breakthroughs to cancer patients. Her key areas of focus for 2021 have included patient centricity, health equity, precision medicine, and understanding overarching dynamics impacting care for patients. This session will be led by Barry Stein, President and CEO of Colorectal Cancer Canada. In addition to moderating this session, Barry will introduce our audience to a colorectal cancer led colorectal cancer Canada led initiative with broad partnership across the cancer care ecosystem that you'll be hearing much more about in the coming in coming months entitled PACT, patient centered approach to clinical trials. Over to you, Barry. Thanks very much, Anne-Marie, and it's a pleasure to be here with uh, both you, Sarah, and Marianne, and to talk about patient centricity. Uh, patient centricity is something that's very personal to me. Uh, I was diagnosed, as, uh, as some of you may know, in 1995 with metastatic colon cancer and uh, had to access uh, both treatment and clinical trials uh, in the United States, um, uh, a vaccine trial in one case, in another case to get a trial started in Canada uh, with one of the basic, with what is now one of the basic therapies uh, for the treatment of colon cancer. So participating in these trials really meant the difference between life and death for me at that time. Uh, there were really no resources available for patients and participating in the clinical trial was a little bit different. You just sort of showed up. You had no say it worked for you or it didn't work for you. But in one case, I actually had to get very involved with uh, a clinical trial uh, back in 1999, uh, actually, just at the uh, eve of the year 2000, when the whole world and everything was going to explode when the clocks uh, uh, went to the new millennium. And I had to write a protocol um, uh, or help write a protocol for the clinical trial just on that basis. So that was my first uh, time getting involved with a clinical trial, albeit not on the protocol, but uh, on the real protocol, but on, on the time change uh, and, and creating a consent uh, document for that. So um, it really is something very personal to me, and that's uh, what happened when we started our work at Colorectal Cancer Canada 
we decided that this was a, an issue that was much bigger than ourselves, much bigger than one disease site and something that really transcended um, all patient organizations and we had to get together. So about the same time that Pfizer started doing their work with the POPSI program, we together with our working group, um, uh, which was composed of industry representative, clinical trial networks, patient researchers, researchers uh, themselves, um, clinical research organizations, clinical trial networks, and a whole host of other people um, that just really wanted to get involved in uh, accessing clinical trials in Canada. And uh, for those of you that don't know, patients in Canada for, you know, once a product is FDA approved, likely access these new therapies by way of clinical trials for a couple of years before they're approved and reimbursed in Canada. So here really is extremely important and, you know, ensuring that uh, patient centricities, that patients are engaged in these clinical trials really does make a difference. And we know in Canada that participation uh, rates in clinical trials and cancer clinical trials run between two and 6%. So really quite low in terms of recruitment. And we started to ask the question, why, you know, why is that so? And what we came to the conclusion with, and it was validated by some of the work done by the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative at Duke University, was that patient groups were really, and patients were not being involved in the clinical trial continuum, right from the ideation of the trial, all the way through uh, to even post-trial uh, work. And in Canada, that makes a really big difference because patients and patient groups provide input to the health technology assessment bodies in terms of reimbursement of drugs. So patient preferences and values is fundamentally important in this context. So we went to work and we looked at the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative at Duke and we said, how can we Canadianize this model? And we did that, taking account of Health Canada's perspective, of CADIS and Ines's perspective in the health technology assessment side. And we saw that by involving the patient groups from ideation of the trial and the creation of the protocol all the way through, we had the potential not only to increase knowledge about clinical trials for patients and for researchers to show how they could work together because researchers also have to be informed how to work with patients and patient groups to, it, to improve retention of patients in clinical trials and to really uh, better the experience for patients so that um, we could really understand their preferences and then take that information and work um, with our uh, regulatory and HDA bodies to um, try to ensure that these drugs, um, you know, patients get access to these drugs in the long term. And then ultimately in the future, uh, we hope to be involved in the collection of real world data uh, post marketing. So with that, we based uh, um, the construction of something that we call the clinical trials um, charter, stakeholder charter, that could help to govern the relationship between sponsors of trials, and that could be a pharmaceutical company or it could be an academic, based on five base uh, guiding principles of patient centricity, commitment to education and training, collaboration as equal and independent partners in research, transparency and accountability, and high standards in data collection and accountability. And from there, we developed these five tenants as a working group that over a period of uh, four or five years, together with the conference attendees and the working group, a working group um, established these five tenants. And I think that these five tenants are kind of common goals, whether you're a initiator of a trial, a sponsor of a trial, or a participant in a trial. And that is making patient centricity the norm in clinical trials, which I know that Pfizer is very supportive of. Supporting education, training, and development of patient group members for effective participation in the design and implementation of clinical trial protocols on behalf of patients. Collaborating with patient groups as equal and independent partners to optimize the success of trials adhering to transparency and accountability throughout the clinical trial continuum and maximizing the potential to collect and utilize real world evidence and data captured in clinical trials. 
So I know that patient centricity within Pfizer is a long-standing trans transition with robust and mature uh, patient advocacy uh, efforts and the uh, patient-centric ecosystem that you've created with patient -centric, with a patient-centric advisory group has really um, helped to uh, change the way Pfizer is looking at, at things. So first, I, I want to turn to Marianne and ask you, can you explain to us what POPSI is? What, what, what is this initiative exactly? And how did it come about? Sure. Well, um, first of all, I want to thank you, Barry, for sharing that s story and also educating me on what's going on in Canada and some of the efforts you're leading. We're really grateful that Colorectal Can Cancer Canada is allowing us to share our work. Um, so I lead a team at Pfizer that's committed to patient centricity. Pfizer's committed to that. But prior to joining this team, I spent nearly a decade um, as an advocate leading strategic relations for a group called the Association of Community Cancer Centers. Um, and this provides me with a really unique lens. And it's also my philosophy that it's not one individual or one organization, kind of to echo your remarks, Barry, Barry that it's going to make a change to address medical policy and societal challenges. Um, these challenges are going to require multiple diverse perspectives and a group, group effort to prioritize the most critical activities for the greatest possible impact to ensure patients can benefit from advances in science and get the best care possible. Um, so how did Pfizer Oncology's patient centric, uh, centricity ecosystem, or what we lovingly refer to as POPSI, come about? Well, we knew that to solve for some of the complex care issues we're facing, um, working with advocacy leaders like yourself would be key. And we also understood that there's more we could be doing and that at times, based on the activity, there's times where Pfizer could lead, but there's also times where we should join and times when we should follow. So in 2019, um, we launched POPSI at our annual advocacy event at ASCO where we hosted about 30 advocacy leaders and we had them join Pfizer leaders uh, for discussions in five topic areas that impact patients. And this resulted in over 40 ideas. So over the latter half of 2019, we worked with these leaders to identify three priority areas for collaboration. These ended up being health literacy, health equity, and patient engagement in clinical trials. Our leaders have continued to work side by side with advocacy leaders to improve how we're supporting cancer patients. And in 2020, like everyone else, we had to evolve our model so we could continue to effectively work together in a virtual setting. So we launched three virtual work streams to continue in, to engage a broad network of advocacy partners. And we even invited more partners to join. Um, when we launched these, Barry, we started by taking time in each work stream to level set and share our work, both what Pfizer's been doing, but also what the advocates have been doing. Um, and the really neat thing is because advocates volunteered for the different work streams, we ended up with a very unique mix of leaders across disease areas. So it provided a touch point for shared ideas between groups that might not often get to work together. And as you mentioned, we also set up our patient centricity advisors or our PCA. Um, so this is a group of seven diverse and dynamic leaders that are helping us with the connectivity across the work streams, but they're also helping us understand where we might still have blind spots and to think about emerging areas that we should be uh, addressing. So POPSI is our enhanced framework for patient advocacy engagement. Instead of a one-time meeting, this is a conversation over time to move forward and rapidly integrate patient perspectives into every facet of our work. And this dynamic approach is really allowing us to leverage multiple touch points um, and pursue a feedback loop. But most importantly, it's helping us drive forward change and solutions, patient-centric change. So uh, that's really interesting. And you mentioned um, that the POPSI work was, uh, there was a stream, one of the work streams had to do with clinical trials, engagement in clinical trials. Can you, Tell us how that works, how some of those elements, uh, you know, that from the POPSI program, how that relates to clinical trials? Sure. Um, so our clinical trials work streams co-led by my colleagues, Sue Hensley, Rob Ruckman, and Lucy Ma. And um, when we launched in October of 2020, our Pfizer Oncology Global Product Development Leadership helped us with this. So they came to, um, to the meeting and we had about 20 groups involved. Um, and we shared the hope in our pipeline as well as our commitment to engaging patients throughout our clinical development programs. 
Um, we level set as I, as I detailed earlier. Um, and since that time, we've had over nine meetings uh, with more than 20 advocacy partners and engagement across leadership at Pfizer, including Pfizer's worldwide research and development team and our global product development to discuss examples of Pfizer's efforts to advance patient centricity in the clinical development process, as well as examples from our patient advocacy partners and how and where we can align jointly with the advocacy community. Um, but I wanna share three examples um, to make this more concrete. So first, in one of the meetings, Rich Hutchins and colleagues from our worldwide research and development team um, discussed Pfizer's patient-centric approach to medicine administration. And I like to think of this, I'm not a scientist, but I like to think of this as how the platforms that medicines are delivered, delivered in, whether this is IV, oral, tablet, capsule, and I think as many of the audience members here can relate, be they patients, caregivers, or advocates, um, this impacts a patient's experience. So this discussion allowed the group to talk about patient preferences for therapy and the impact on lifestyle related to medicine administration. My second example is um, one of the meetings we brought in our equity and we brought our equity and the clinical trials work stream together for a discussion with Sandra Amaro. She heads our clinical trial diversity efforts at Pfizer um, across the enterprise, not just for oncology. And during this forum, we discussed clinical trial diversity and we shared our efforts and our goals and the strides we've been making to establish diversity in terms of race, ethnicity, age, and sex across our clinical research por portfolio. So Pfizer is committed to achieving diverse participation at or above US census levels um, as appropriate in all of our trials to and to fulfill this commitment, we're taking several important actions. We're embedding the importance of diversity within our organization. We're evolving site partnership with a data-driven approach to choosing clinical trial site. We're building trust and awareness in communities in the US, and we're addressing practical barriers to trial participation, including the use of digital tools. And most importantly, in forums like this, we're trying to share our knowledge. Um, and third and finally, Sarah Pearson, who's here with me today, um, is she came to the work stream and discussed our protocol optimization workbench and specifically highlighted our patient insight work, which she'll detail more deeply. So we're making real concerted so efforts at Pfizer with POPSI. Um, and our ask is that everyone comes to the table with a willingness to share and to listen and also that we can follow up so we can celebrate where we're able to make changes. And when we're not, we continue to work together to solve for some of the complexities. I, I think that's really interesting. And you mentioned a couple of themes that came up in some of our other sessions today. And one of them has to do with diversity and equity in clinical trials. And the other, of course, is the building of trust. And th that work, those are two themes that we see uh, in our in cancer clinical trials that people are taking different perspectives and, and looking at it for different reasons. So for example, obviously for the diversity issue, um, particularly in the United States with the African American population and in Canada with the indigenous populations here, we they are often underrepresented in clinical trials. And this is something that obviously could, could affect the outcome of a trial or skew the outcome of a trial. And something that we've actually seen some, uh, uh, at least in the colorectal cancer space, trials that have been done in Asia that didn't have the North American population. So diversity is very important um, in terms of outcomes of clinical trials for sure, and ultimately their approval. But also the building of trust, of course, with the communities to participate, for patients to participate in trials, to trust the sponsor of the trial or the people, the, the, the clinical research organization running the trial and ultimately, I think patient groups can play a very central role in helping to build that trust and bringing those uh, diverse uh, communities into trials. And I know that Sarah has been working on some of these things in the different work streams as well. And that, uh, Sarah, you've been working on a program uh, called Patient Insights. And I, I was wondering if you could briefly explain that to us. What, what is Patient Insights? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, I'd like to um, echo Marianne's gratitude for for having us and and including these topics um, in your conference. Um, but uh, it, I, I would like to discuss this a little bit. Patient insights is something that is part of a larger. Um, it's one of four pillars, rather. Um, we have a workbench that we developed several years ago here at Pfizer called the Protocol Optimization Workbench. 
And in that workbench, there's four key areas um, that we focus. One is real world data. The other is investigator insights, which is basically seeking um, feedback about our designs of our protocols and other things from our investigators um, that specialize in certain indications. Um, the third is patient insights, which is what I'm going to talk about more um, with you. And the fourth is protocol simulation, um, which the two that really impact um, largely uh, and, and include that very patient centric kind of view are the patient insights and the protocol simulations. The way that I would describe the difference in the two of those is that patient insights is the who, what, how, what, or I'm sorry, the who, why, what. Um, and the protocol simulation is more of the how something is done. Um, so patient insights is basically, um, well, it came about, honestly, because we were looking for ways um, to really ensure that we were keeping our patients first as we were designing our clinical trials and that we were getting patient feedback about um, not only their experiences, um, their treatment pathway, um, impacts um, from, from their uh, disease on their life, um, how they've made medical decisions, um, but also really about the studies themselves. So we would, we would often present um, what we would present as a hypothetical study and ask patients very directed questions about the study visit design, um, how many visits there were, the method in which um, the investigational medicine was delivered, any procedures that may happen. Um, but patient insights was really, really uh, intended to help ensure our protocols are designed with that patient perspective in mind so, so that we can deliver the best possible uh, trials for the patients that need them most. So Some, yes, I, I go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna. I was just gonna add that um, you had just talked about diversity uh, with Marianne a little bit, and one of the the key elements that we always try to do at the very earliest stages is make sure that our insights are representative. So we're we're not we're actively trying to make sure that when we speak to patients. Um, that we're speaking to patients from not only racial and ethnic um, uh, uh, diversity, but rural and urban um, education levels um, and, and all those kind of uh, differences as well. Um, and really, the, the goal is to reduce that burden um, for people to be able to participate. And, and, and therefore, um, that really helps make sure that we can, we can bring our medicines to the world a little bit faster. And I would think that part of that really has to do with patient literacy as well, patients understanding uh, what's involved, understanding the language and how they can play a mm -hmm. role. Uh, and then you're able to collect their, that feedback. How do you go about collecting the feedback from patients? And how can you explain to patients who may not be so literate about clinical trials uh, or even the, the language or, or what clinical trials are, are, are meant to do and, and what what they want to accomplish, what questions they want to answer. How do you collect patient feedback um, in that process? Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, we conduct patient insights in, in kind of a variety of ways. There's methods in which we can do that, some of which are things like um, surveys and online forums. Um, others are like web listening, which is um, something that can be done online, uh, focus groups and workshops. But the two key elements that we've really honed in on um, here at Pfizer is um, in-depth interviews, like a one-on-one -on -one, or sometimes a focus groups kind of in-depth uh, discussion guide, moderated discussion guide um, with patients that that have the indication that we're, um, that we're looking to learn more about. Um, and so when that often occurs, uh, what we'll do is we'll work with um, a combination of um, like a market research approach and a patient advocacy approach. So in several instances, what we've done is we've worked with um, advocacy organizations um, to to identify and, and, and help us um, 
find the patients that we want to speak with, but then we're very careful to have kind of a moderated session from an expert uh, person to be able to ask individuals questions um, that is not influenced by us. So we might help decide or, or guide the kind of discussion guide and the way in which the information that we um, need to understand better to help the protocol and the study design. Because some of these things are actually operational. They're, I mean, many of these items that we're looking and we're, and we're learning from patients and sometimes their caregivers, I will add that too, um, is is protocol level type of things where we're really trying to impact the study but then some of the other items are actually, um, you know, more operationally driven. And these are things like um, how, you know, do we need to look at travel to and from a study site? Um, how can we better communicate to your point of health literacy? Are there ways that there are, is there something informationally that patients are seeking that we can provide um, to make that process, whether it's the decision-making process or the continuation of participation, just that much, um, a little bit easier, less burdensome for, for people? So through this type of work, I, I, you know, a lot of the work that um, uh, payers and, and regulatory people look at are based on uh, uh, EQ5DL, some of these validated assessment tools, uh, the, the uh, European EORTC questionnaires, for example. And it sounds like that you're doing a lot more qualitative work in addition to uh, the quantitative uh, work that's done through surveys. Um, and through these pa through your patient insights program, um, I, I was wondering how have these impacted uh, and changed some of the trial uh, protocols in your experience? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So um, yeah, some very concrete examples were um, in the protocol perspective. In one instance, we were able to reduce the number of clinic visits um, by seven and replace them with a home visit option. Um, we were also able to allow for blood draws to be done at home or at the clinic. It was really um, based on the patient preference. So that was something that was directly impacted in a protocol. Um, some of the, we've, we've also had um, the study dosing um, be scheduled to align with the standard of care treatment visits. Um, something else that occurred in one of our other protocols were in the uh, screening process after the informed consent was signed, um, we allowed for the acceptance of uh, CT scans from their standard of care cancer uh, treatment pathway in lieu of having that occur again. Like, so it, it, uh, kind of unnecessarily putting a, a patient through a CT scan again, even though um, they, had, they had had one recently. So those are a couple examples that really impact to the protocol. Another actually was um, we had a, there was a dilution strategy that was reworked um, based on patient preference. And so um, it basically allowed for fewer injections uh, per dose. So there, those are some very concrete examples of protocol um, driven things. But I would say there are other things too, like we um, Pfizer has a program called Gratitude and Thoughtful Closure in which we really aim to make sure that we are expressing um, quite uh, actively and regularly to our participants um, that that feeling of being grateful and gracious uh, for for them volunteering their time um, and 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 themselves to be part of something uh, you know so important um, something else is that I already mentioned kind of in the health literacy route, when we develop um, items, and these can be everything from maybe a booklet that helps someone understand the process um, once they've enrolled in a trial to something even before they sign an informed consent that helps describe the study to them. Um, they can be written in a very clear and communicative way that's um, written also in, in a very health liter literate way. Um, we've done quite a bit of work in that space and have learned a lot over the years. Um, and another good example that um, has come, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go, that's good. I want to hear all your examples. It's great. I was just going to say so another example. Oh, go ahead. 
Sorry, one thing I would add to is with the health literacy piece, you know, we've got, a, we put a position paper out earlier this year. So we've got a health literacy continuum of practice that sits across the enterprise of Pfizer. It brings our internal expertise and external expertise. And we're really trying to make sure that our information, the science information is more accessible, um, that we've got patient facing materials that are accessible. And in fact, we had our advocacy groups that were part of the health literacy work stream provide feedback on what we're doing in health literacy so that we could have, you know, a patient centric approach with it. So it's, that's something that's really key. Pfizer has been working on that for years um, because we know that it has real impact for people if they don't understand um, what decisions they're making or, or basic information about their health, they're not going to make decisions that will lead to optimal outcomes, both for their quality of life yes. um, and experience of care. Well, and quite frankly, I mean, health health literacy impacts a person's ability to even know clinical trials are an option, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, is something that, you know, often we all know how um, how clinical trial kind of disclosure, right? The the clinical trials .gov type of examples, that's a U.S. example, um, can be very hard for uh, a person, even in our world, to understand sometimes and navigate. Um, uh, navigate that specific is, is it absolutely the navigating clinical trials yeah. gov is a problem, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, not insurmountable, and it does have to be narrowed down nope. when you uh, when you put in when you put in your question or your 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 concern, and then you know, uh, ten thousand uh, uh, results come back. So that that is something that abs absolutely trial finders have been working on. I think, and I, that is something definitely to look forward to. Um, you mentioned Marianne, and, and Sarah, you could answer this as well too about um, you know the end of a trial and expressing gratitude. I, I was just wondering, do you keep um, follow up post trial with patients uh, to see how they're doing and collect some additional real world data? Yeah, so Pfizer actually has a program called PfizerLink, which is where our clinical trial participants are invited to sign up for, um, it, it, you know, being able to be kind of kept up to date, um, you know, post-trial participation. And that is everything from like, um, you know, plain language summary of, you know, trial results once those are available and posted, notification of that to other resources that can be available for a person. So there is that ability, um, it, it, but of course that's optional. If a participant wants to sign up, they can. Um, and if they don't, they don't have to. Um, but it's something that we do focus on. Um, and actually, interestingly, as we were talking about the, um, the health literacy piece and all these really kind of important um, components that we work on here and and you know seem to be something that is important across industry and 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 for patients is that um within the um the recent development we had mentioned earlier about that Pfizer clinical trial um website um there's a lot of information in there that has really been designed to help people understand in a very lay friendly um, health literate way about clinical trials, but then to the point at, um, of, of navigating clinical trials, we also have a trial finder for Pfizer clinical trials on that site. Um, and the goal is to try to make that easier for people. So for example, there's like an oncology page and all of the different indications, um, types of cancer are listed there. And if a person clicks on it, they would get a list of the studies for that um, for like melanoma or colorectal or, you know, uh, prostate cancer or things like that. So there are very specific and concrete things that we are continuing to do to try to make um, the experience as patient centric as possible. So I'm glad you brought up the uh, oncology, some of the oncology uh, aspects of this. And Sarah, I was wondering if you could give some examples, maybe from the oncology perspective, how patient insights have actually impacted or changed the trial or protocols in the first place. Yeah, well, a couple of the examples that we ran through a few minutes ago were actually specifically from our oncology trials. So the reduction of clinic visits. Um, we actually have a one that uh, Marianne and I both are really familiar with, which was a study of uh, cachexia anorexia in cancer patients. 
And that actually had a, um, a, a home visit design, like a, like a, where it was both clinic and home visit. And there were, and based on both patient and investigator preference, um, was something that, um, you know, was, was specifically feedback that we had received, um, from conducting patient insights, but something that's, that I, one of the examples I, I wanted to give that we've actually seen come up several times in the oncology space is really about making sure that that ability to get to and from um, the study appointments, especially for people, uh, maybe maybe they don't have someone immediately that can help them do that. Um, maybe it's a matter of of making sure they can get there, um, whether that's, you know, literally helping provide travel arrangements um, or whether that's reimbursing for travel. Um, there are ways and feedback that we've received there to really make that as, as easy as possible uh, for people to even be able to participate. Just, you know, be, be one more of those things that we can do um, to, to, be, um, to try to be that, that very patient-centric and focused um, team. You know, you really, you really uh, I brought up a few points, actually, both of you that, that starting to make me think about the direction that Pfizer is going with respect to clinical trials. You mentioned the ability to do the CT scan locally as opposed to have to come to the trial site, the ability to have home visits, um, the issue of travel to the uh, clinical trial site, for example. So is Pfizer mm -hmm. thinking about uh, perhaps expanding uh, the use of decentralized uh, mm -hmm. trials? Um, I would say the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. And I think, honestly, um, the impact, um, you know, and, and decentralization of our clinical trials is not my personal subject matter expertise, but um, I, I do support one. It's not in the oncology space at the moment. Um, and they're, they're, I would say that one of the things, if anything, that, um, that the pandemic we've all been 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 living through has really done is it has um, put some of the the big ideas, the innovations in the fast lane to really be able to make sure that we can do the things that are best for patients um, in ways. And I would say that I, there is definitely more to come in that decentralized model. And I would just right. add and to that, that right? Not I would just add to that too, bringing it back to the collective network. Um, we're really working with a lot of advocacy organizations to help us understand and think through what that could look like, right? Because it's not just Pfizer that's going to be able to change how how trials are delivered. It's a whole network. You know this, Barry, right? And so we've been joining forums that are hosted by our U.S. advocacy organizations to get a more holistic understanding. And I would say one of the things that we talked about in our clinical trial work stream, we actually had the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network come on um, to talk about specifically those ancillary costs and the issues of, of how people get to trials and supporting them on it. Um, and through having them join that forum, uh, it's ignited all of the advocacy leaders where there's actually a diverse uh, trials act that's right now AACS can is trying to get um, groups to sign on to. And that's going on right now um, by bringing them into that forum. It's helping us connect to all of these groups that might have taken longer. So I think the other maybe, I guess, benefit of of COVID um, in these virtual platforms, while it's not as much fun as being together, is that we're able to speed up some of the conversations and connectivity so that we can really drive forward change. Yes, and the immediacy of the situation during COVID has really given us the experience that things can happen at a faster pace. And through, uh, through the virtual visits, of course, that we've done the, uh, throughout this uh, COVID and, and people getting used to doing that through the uh, uh, some of the reforms that you're talking about, being able to accept local uh, CTs, perhaps local blood work at the same time, uh, home visits and so forth. Uh, in some cases, the use of CT DNA, liquid biopsies uh, being done at, at a far um, inclusion of more diverse groups by doing it more decentralized. But very particularly because of the advance of precision medicines, we're starting to identify smaller, smaller groups, smaller and smaller groups of patients who might um, have a, a, a similar mutation, but they're hard to find because they're spread out uh, throughout the country or perhaps through uh, globally. 
Um, so decentralized trials may provide some of the answers to that question. So it's, it's really nice to see that the thinking is starting to evolve in that area, not just with Pfizer, of course. Uh, in Canada, there's a lot of discussion about that. Some of the clinical trial networks have put together white papers on what that would look for, would look like in terms of gathering, um, um, setting the satellite centers and so forth around this. So um, I'm doing a little bit of talking about COVID and how it seems to have impacted um, the clinical trial networks and research in Canada. I'm wondering how has COVID specifically impacted your work um, uh, on a daily basis uh, in the POPSI program? Well, I mean, I think that it drove us to innovate, right? We Pfizer was innovating, right, to solve for it, but it also drove us to innovate for how we work with groups that we oftentimes would have live meetings with. And through that, I think it's created this connectivity, a web, if you will, where we can ignite and take ideas, the ideas that we came up with in 2019, to address the real issues that patient face, patients face, right? Some of which you, um, highlighted at the start of this session, Barry, um, and drive forward the change. We're not going to do it overnight. We know that. But I like to think about, you know, back in the 90s when you first started your trials, these conversations probably weren't even happening. And now, you know, we're mm -hmm. showing real commitment from leaders to take the patient perspective into account and to really think about, you know, how we're innovating and how we're innovating best for patients. So I think that's what it's kind of underscored for me. I'm, I don't want to stew in the negative aspects of it. I think the positive pieces that we can carry out of this pandemic are what are going to drive forward some really dynamic change for people. So thank you once again, and uh, I'll give it back to Anne-Marie right now. Yeah. Thank you so much, Barry, and special thanks to our uh, friends from uh, Pfizer US for uh, a really tremendously um, uh, positive presentation with uh, many things we can learn about um, uh, things we can do in our country. Um, we're going to take a five minute break um, and come back and uh, hear about uh, building a vibrant Canadian life science environment. See you in a moment. <laughs> 